So you remember I just selected the data points and I went to the elements here and the fit line at total. And so you get this uh, additional window here and we want to fit a linear model. There are some different choices here which will not be interesting for us. Um, and you may choose to have this equation written in here or not and I want maybe to take it away. You apply and you close and there it is with the regression line. And it's I mean it's all described in the in the compendium also. Okay. So we were uh, discussing um, some of these in ingredients. We were talking about this R square as a measure of the explanatory power of the model. Um, and here you see just to, to visualize some different situations regarding the R square. So in this case, uh, you have an x variable which is very strongly affecting the, the y variable and you see that the randomness is very small compared to the, to the dependency on x. So this amounts to an r square of 0 0.98. And then you have different situations here, for instance in the more different side of the equation um, here's a picture where there is a slight negative correlation so but you would say that most of the variation in this variable is caused by randomness so in this case we say only 16 percent of the y variation is is explained uh, by x dependency we might say. Yeah. And you see unlike the correlation this r square is actually quite closely connected to the correlation but it's not going to be a negative number it's always between 0 and 1. So here is a strong negative correlation. It means a lot of the y variation again can be explained by x, only it's now a negative trend. But the r square is still positive. Yeah. OK. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, model assumption check. This is sort of a little bit more of a um, not nightmare, but a little bit more of the difficult part of regression analysis, actually. Um, we have simplified a little bit, but we have this formulation of four basic assumptions of regression models. And we have done some testing. We have done some confidence intervals. And really, most of that is only valid as long as these assumptions are, are satisfied. So it means we should uh, go as far as we can to assert the validity of these assumptions. Um, and I think I'm going to say that um, the one that is most difficult to check is probably A. So we're going to leave it. We're not going to test uh, for that one in this course. Because it has to do with when we observe the x and y together repeatedly, the error terms should just be independent and come up with a new brand new value every time. But it can be a bit difficult to 
to make sure that this happens. Um, this other tree we can at least do something about. So, and we can actually, uh, yeah, we can we can point at some some uh, pictures where the where you're really going to have problem with that assumption, that those three assumptions. And it actually happens in a very fairly typical situation. Yeah. And this has to do with the model structure. So the, f the primary and horrible mistake that you might do in regression is to use a linear model for a relationship that is not linear. And if you do that, you will easily violate all of these three assumptions in, in one go. And luckily, as long as you have only one y and one x variable, it's very usually very easy to see just by a scatter plot whether there are some significant non-linearities in the model. So this picture here shows data that are, I mean, obviously y is depending on the x here, but it seems to happen in a progressive way. So you would expect more of a nonlinear curve to, to cover the, the true dependency here. And if you don't look at the scatter plot, you would easily just put a linear model into SPSS and you might estimate coefficients, you might find this and that, but you would be in real trouble when you interpret your model. So you see for, for instance, if you go high on the x variable here from 30 and upwards, almost all of the y observations are above the line which means you have positive, you have all positive error terms. So they cannot really be zero mean as they should be in that interval. And down in the middle here, they are mostly negative. And down here again, they are mostly positive. So you violate uh, this one and at the same time this, because this says they should have a normal distribution and it should be the same normal distribution. Um, the last one may or may not be okay, but the last one just means that the, the randomness is sort of of the uniform size when you move along the x-axis. So, Basically, the ideal picture in a scatter plot should be something that looks more or less like this. We have the line here. It should be linear and it should sort of have a somewhat fixed size of variation over here. Not being, for instance, like small variations here and then increasing up here. This picture would be a violation of the final E assumption. Or D, maybe it was A, B, C, D. So if you run this through SPSS, you will get coefficient output for this line. You will get an R squared that is 73%, which seems to be fairly OK. Still, the model is not very good, I would say. It's more or less very dangerous for forecasting because it tells you a full pic false picture of the dependence. Yeah. Okay, we are closing in on the chapter four end. Um, there's one assumption that we can do a proper check of, and it is um, yeah, 
It's this one. That the error terms should have a normal distribution. So like this. Because um, well, we don't of course see this uh, Error. I mean, this is a random variable that is su supposed to model the deviation away from a theor theoretical line. And the data representation of the error terms is, of course, Maybe I shouldn't say of course, because it might not be obvious. But the error terms in the data picture, they are represented by these observed deviations, which I called in somewhere, I call them EI. Um, so they are just a difference between what your particular model suggests for you and what you actually observe. So this is x i, this is the observation y i, while this here is your prediction y i hat. And since we are saying that the errors should be normal, we would like to see errors coming on plus and minus side of zero. And in a fashion that resembles more or less an, a normal distribution. And you remember that we had actually in the end of chapter three something called a uh, normality test. Time for a short break. Um, so it, there are two ways. There's one serious way to address this, and that is to to store all of these guys here as a new SPSS variable, and then to make some Schmidinov uh, sophisticated test on the normality of those data. The more uh, common way, just as a start of a regression analysis at least, is to look at normal plots. And while this is off, I can now try to turn it on, by the way. We can introduce a very important term. These guys here, they are called residuals. Residuals, it, it means something that remains after you're finished. Then there's the residuals. So what remains when you're finished with your model? You have explained the y dependency with this line. And what remains is error, randomness, what you cannot explain. So that's why we call them residuals. And they should be um, close to normally distributed. So what we ask for is normal plot of residuals. Uh, and you can ask for this in the SPSS regression output or the regression procedure. And it will look something like this. And then it's the more tricky question, how sure can we be about the interpretation of these normal plots? This is something you have to work on over years or something to develop a kind of experience with normal plots. But you would suspect that this picture here, um, there's a very systematic break with the line here. So those residuals are probably not normal. perfectly normal, at least. And then there's the discussion in, in practical terms. Is this a serious 
departure from normality or is it not? That's a difficult question to answer, actually. Um, and in this picture, there is deviation a little bit from the line, but it seems to be more random and it's clinging pretty good to the line. So this is at least not a, a strong deviation. I have a theory why this thing is breaking because it's breaking only in my classes. No. It's not? Okay, no. good. Or bad. <laughs> De depending. Well, that might break my theory. But uh, I was thinking maybe because I have very white background on my slides that the light bulb gets too warm. But okay, then someone should replace it or fix it. Right. Okay, so my idea now was probably to have a just a uh, quick tour into SPSS. Maybe. Um, so this data material is something we are going to look at uh, more. It's it's a nice uh, place or a nice play ground for forecasting uh, because you have an obvious y variable, the price of a flat, which is, of course, depending on several factors. Um, so we, we're going to play with this data later on more to, to add variables and see what happens when we have several variables at one time and so on. So now we're going to just be very quick and do a little uh, few experiments here. So let's see, the, the primary factor that would explain the price of flats would be the floor space area. But of course, here you have standard, medium, bad, good, and so on. You have different towns, Molde, Kristiansund, Ålesund. Um, so there could be, for instance, different price levels in the three towns, uh, and so on. So we need to build later on a bit more sophisticated models. But for starting now, let's only look at um, up, 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 uh, regression linear, and you put the price there, you put the area here, and let's just go walking. get this whole bunch <laughs> of output. So what I'm going to look at is what's the estimated model. OK, let's call it x. So y is um, 89.8 plus 9.8. Uh, 12 times x. This is the estimated line. And um, the standard test, as you see, comes out with a t at about 37. So the significance, the p value is 0. So there's no doubt. For sure. So we can actually say. So of course, greater than zero. So in general, one more square meter adds to the price. Um, yeah. So then you can start looking at the numbers here. The R square, zero point ninety, telling us that about ninety percent of the price variation that we see in this whole these three markets actually seen together 
90% of all that variation can be attributed to just this variable. So it's extremely important, of course, to decide the prices. And what about forecast errors if we want to just uh, go fast? We go for 95% forecast margin. It's two times uh, this one, which is close to 90. So since we are being a bit approximate, it's about what's two times 90, that's 180. And so that's 180,000 because the, the prices here are in thousands. So it's uh, okay, close to 200,000. And you see the prices at the time when this data were put together. The prices were somewhere around a million typically. So you're missing, you're having like plus minus 20% on the price forecast, which is uh, Well, it's okay for a sort of automatic model, but it, in practice you would like to be able to hit the prices more precisely. So what we're going to see in the coming weeks is how can we improve this when we allow ourselves also to look at the other variables here. And we're going to go considerably lower on this margin here, almost to a level where it would be a, a, a practical tool for a estate broker, for instance, to, to use this model. So let's just try one other uh, model. And now I did not produce the confidence intervals there, but um, okay. so I should have had over here the confidence interval for the for the coefficient. Now this coefficient is important, it's really the square meter price, or it's what we call the marginal square meter price, it's sort of the extra cost for another additional square meter. Right. Yeah. And you're going to do a lot of this in your exercises, uh, let's do just another one, kick out that one. And what can we do? Something crazy. So what am I going to do? This means essentially we're trying to. So this this variable uh, I should have told you. This variable that I used here is the distance to the town center, which is registered for all flats. Anyone that sort of try to try to predict the price based on only that variable, right? How good is that going to be? Not too good, I guess. Um, of course, we know that probably being central is a little bit more expensive than being far from the center. But if this is the only thing you look at, you ignore this, the square meter size, you ignore anything else, you're not going to have very good predictions. <laughs> so actually, yeah. So it's actually going to be horrible. The R square is just like this. So it means only 2.2% explained. Uh, as opposed to 90% when you used the um, we used uh, square meters. Um, the 
SE here is about 280. So 2 SE is 560. And I think plus minus 560,000, that's basically the whole range of prices in this whole sample. So you're not really, you need to have error margins that's equal to the most expensive to the cheapest flat in the sample. So this is a hopeless forecast model, really. And you can see, you can not see, but you should have been able to see. Um, oh, it's coming up. You see, if we if we like to have a significance level of 0 0.05, this distance here, it comes out with the correct sign. It's actually one additional kilometers out of town is on average uh, removing 23,000 from the price but it's not really even a significant predictor so you cannot this is a case where we are not able to reject this one in the in the standard test and you will understand all of this especially well if we do what we should always do um, namely produce a scatter plot and now kicking out the area and introducing the distance to center um, right. so it looks like this the x variable is only in integer kilometers but that doesn't matter but you see, knowing this variable here doesn't really tell us anything valuable about the price. The error margin here, 560, you can, you can easily compare to, it's about from here, which is almost the average price, down to here somewhere. And the fact that we cannot reject that one, it does not rule out the fact that this relation is actually, actually looking like this. So it, we have no strong evidence of, this, of the impact of this variable. Actually. So this is how it looks when R square is basically zero. It looks more or less like you took a shotgun and fired at the, at the shark. There's no structure of the dependency there. And compared to, well, we probably have it um, there. This is R square 0 0.90. Still a lot of randomness, but obvious, obvious dependency. Right? Good. So this is what you're going to do a little bit in the chapter four exercises, some variants of this. Um, so, yep, I'll take a little short uh, time to start talking about chapter five actually. Um, So of course it's, it's fairly important that you try to work through the chapter four exercises before diving into this. Uh, we're gonna build on the understanding of basic regression. And then we need to point out some major 
uh, new issues that, that comes up. But the topic in chapter 5 is in general linear models still, but they are now called multiple linear models. And that means they look something like this instead. So it's the, uh, the principle is exactly the same. You just have the possibility of having more than one x variable. And if you start thinking a little bit, or you don't even have to start thinking, you just realize probably obviously that most of the things that you like to study in science or in the world would typically depend on several other quantities. <coughs> so if you run an airline or you're the in the supply chain management team of an airliner, you might be very interested in the demand for tickets from Trondheim to Oslo or something. And you would call that Y, the number of tickets you can sell in a month, for instance. And this would probably not be a linear function, but it would be a function of your own prices. Um, plus the prices of uh, competing services. So other airliners, train, cost of using cars and stuff, buses. And it might also be depending on campaigning efforts and so on. So there's one variable depending on several others. Um, I don't know if you know this company, it's, it's called Yara, it's a, well, I don't know if you can call it a Norwegian company, but it's, it's listed on the Norwegian stock market. It was originally Norwegian, now it's, well, it's mainly owned by the Norwegian government, I guess. But uh, it's a global uh, fertilizer uh, producer. And the price of the share of this stock is a very complicated uh, variable. It will depend on a lot of things, but notably on the gas prices, because they use a lot of gas uh, plants to produce their fertilizers. It's very en energy demanding to produce this stuff, and most of it is used not, pro not produced in Norway, but in Ukraine and so on, and they depend highly on the, the gas prices as a, an input factor. And also the raw material prices, they have to take raw materials and energy and put it together and produce something. And so that's on the cost side, but on the income side they have um, their prices which is also depending heavily on agricultural product prices. So the prices of grain, corn and stuff will very quickly uh, affect the price of this share if you keep the other variables constant there. So this is very complex dependency and we're not going to go anywhere close to trying to model this in this course. Um, but just an example where some variable depends on a lot of other things. Um, something more down to earth and more to down to logistics maybe. Um, you have a city, you have a company running intercity delivery routes. Um, so here's your depot where you pick up stuff and you want to go on a route visiting customers to pick up or deliver stuff. And for the planner, uh, it must be very important to try to figure out the, the expected duration of this trip. So it would be a function, probably more or less complicated, 
but it would at least uh, need to take into account the number of stops. So you stop at customers, you you give them something and you take something. Maybe you chat a little bit, have a cigarette, whatever. Uh, but it takes some time. So it's some, something like proportional to the number of stops, I would guess. Uh, then there is driving between the customers. So the total distance of the route would be clearly affecting the duration. Um, this would also probably be proportional. So if it's five or if it's 10 kilometers, it's going to take uh, on average twice the time as five kilometers, provided that the traffic is the same around the route. And then thirdly, you have something that is a little bit more complicated because this route can be 10 kilometers and it can go quite swiftly in some traffic conditions, but when traffic starts jamming up, it might be just uh, three or four times the duration. So you have the traffic. Um, which affects the speed of the thing. So it, it interacts somehow with the, with the length of the route in some complicated way. So more or less none of the things that I've discussed here will fit exactly with the linear model. Right. So, but we're going to start talking about the linear model because it, you will be surprised how much we can get out of this just by doing some tricks later on. So we're going to be able to model uh, or to solve the problem at least for the first one and the third one by using some sort of linear model. In the end. Okay. So um, so clearly the, the thing with that we have worked on as basic, you have one x and one y, is too limited for practical purposes. So we want to extend to use several x variables. And I think the step sort of is much bigger than you maybe realize in the first place. So it's going to take us into a world that is extremely much more flexible than only the two variable regression models. Yeah. So when we say regression analysis, and I say it's very important. In science, I mean, after we have extended to the nonlinear models, that's when it's really going to be starting to rock and roll in a way. I'm not sure if everyone will agree with the, that word by Christmas, but uh, yeah, let's see. So. The basic purpose of multiple models are, of course, the same as before. We take some situation, a y variable and some x variables. And then if we are lucky, we have data for all of the variables observed together. And then we can estimate a model. So we get coefficient estimates. And this enables us to hopefully understand how does this x2 guy actually work on the y? How is the bus prices affecting the demand of my airline tickets and so on? And um, if we can understand that, we can also hopefully use this model for forecasting. So it's the same as before, only in a much broader scale. In a way. It's a friend of students, or <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but 
ah, it's a good point to just stop. <laughs> you can look at the two final slides yourself. And, uh, and we continue next week.